Hello everyone, Dr. Chris Martinson here. We are at episode three in this little mini series I put together. You can tell because I'm wearing the same jacket and the same same tie because I'm recording all of these at once. So what are we talking about? It's um, it's this, this gets dark folks and gets dark quickly. I'm calling this the Medazolam murders. I got this from the inestimable Jicky Leaks who I get so much from and his mouse army. These are people who are surfacing all kinds of things through FOIA, common sense, sleuthing, digging around, it's just astonishing. So this was something that was written back here um, on February 7th where I first came across this. Jicky Leaks writing, holy crap, this is the data for midazolam prescribing from the UK's official prescriber database. I have no words. So um, I'm gonna tell you what this all means and it's pretty dark. So. This is coming, let me just do the setup here first. This is coming from the lockdown files, the reporting in the Telegraph. So this is an article that just came out recently. They said here that Matt Hancock rejected the chief medical officer's advice to test for COVID all residents going into English care homes, nursing homes that is, um, and leaked messages seen by the Telegraph reveal. So Matt Hancock, He's rejecting the chief medical officer's advice, which is, hey, maybe we should test people going into the nursing homes where the oldest and most vulnerable people are. And this is at the time when they knew about the age stratification. So think about how dark that is. Matt Hancock overruling his chief medical officer saying, oh no, we, we, let's not test everybody that we're putting into the old folks home. Same thing that happened in New York under Cuomo. They took people who were sick with COVID and they pushed them into nursing homes, one of the worst possible things you could think to do. But of course, a fifth grader could reason that out who had just been you know, given, given 10 minutes. Obviously a bad idea, obviously actually one of the stupidest ideas you could do. Heck, put these people in a tent out in the open like 1918 in the Spanish flu and we would have had a much better outcome. But somehow New York and the UK said, you know what we'll do? We won't test, we'll take these sick people and we'll put them in the old folks home. All right, so mysterious. Wow, we're just gonna take a little bit of a break from that. That's kind of a, it's really disturbing, isn't it? This whole idea that our medical system is that dysfunctional, especially in the UK. That's the world we live in now. And if it's got you down, making you think you're a little crazy, maybe that you're the nut, you're not. And to help you understand that, I wanna make it easy for you to come over and try out a membership at Peak Prosperity, where we are the number one online resilience community, emphasis on community. Great people, a lot of intelligence right there, a lot of very successful people, and we're all not crazy. We've got integrity, we're very welcoming, we'd love to have you there. So try out this code for 10% off, first 25 people get 10% off of trying out a Peak Prosperity membership, and we'd love to have you there and see you there. But, well, let's get back to this episode now and carry on with this story. Professor Sir Chris Whitty told the then health secretary early in April 2020, about a month into the pandemic, that there should be testing for, this is April 2020, I'll show you when, when their death statistics sort of spiked it. Well, actually, you can see it here. Um, this is uh, from April 17th here, just this great part here, April 17th through August 13th. But you can see that the actual... Um, wave of deaths here that presumably were from COVID. We're going to find out maybe not all of them were actually from COVID. Started back here in uh, end of March, towards the end of March. So he said uh, he said that there should be testing for all going into care homes, but Mr. Hancock did not follow that guidance, telling his advisors that it muddies the waters. What what water? What what? How does that muddy the waters? How, what waters could be muddied by saying that we want to test all the people going into the care homes to see if they're carrying an active, transmissible, respiratory, viral infection. How does that muddy the waters? You know what muddies the waters? Not doing that. That muddies 100 plus years of known scientific and pandemic advice. But at any rate, let's carry on. Instead, he introduced guidance that made testing mandatory for those entering care homes from hospital, but not those coming from the community. Oh, well, that clarifies it. 
there. We didn't muddy the waters by saying everybody needs to come in. We clarified it by saying, oh, if you're coming from a hospital, we'll test you. But not if you're coming from the community. And we know we have community transmission of this stuff. There, clear. We've just clarified the waters. It's as clear as a river in East Palestine, Ohio. It's just, I don't even know what's happening here, right? Okay, prior to the guidance, care homes had been told that negative tests were not required, even for hospital patients. Water's getting clearer. The guidance stated that those coming from in from the community should be tested was eventually introduced on August 14th. August 14th. So that's when it finally got introduced. And of course, this gray bar goes out to here, here. There were no COVID deaths in, at that point in time. So once it was all passed, they're like, oh, oh, yeah, now we'll test people. Crazy, unsupportable, really weird. But between April 17th and August 13th, 2020, here they say that a total of 17,678 people died of COVID in care homes in England. You know who else is in care homes? People with Alzheimer's, typically. Kind of, kind of interesting. And I raised that because uh, we got to go to this chart right here, which is, again, I'm bringing out that statement, which says a total of 17,678 people died of COVID in care homes between April 17th and August 13th. But in this other paper down here, we find that, and um, we know that uh, 17,316 patients died in England in April of 2020 alone with dementia and Alzheimer's disease recorded on their death certificate. So these are people from care homes, guaranteed. This number of deaths was nearly three times more than expected. So if we just do a little quick math, we find out about 11,000 people died of dementia and Alzheimer's disease in care homes when they were reporting that 17,678 people died in care homes. How many of those 11,000 people actually died of dementia and Alzheimer's disease? And what did they actually die of? Because nobody dies of dementia. They died with it. It was on the death certificate. Now we have to look into how they actually provide care for people in these so-called and totally misnamed care homes. Okay. So I'm going to guess, though, that of these 17,678 people, a whole bunch of them were actually these same 11,000 people down here. Why does this matter? Because... Um, we see here that government guidance in its mission and care of people homes document was not updated to require care homes to test for new admissions until August 14, 2020. And it was early July before staff in all care homes had regular access to weekly tests. So that wasn't happening. But what was happening back there in March, April of 2020? Mr. Hancock later told the Health and Social Care Select Committee that the strongest root of the virus into care homes, unfortunately, is community transmission. So what we know is that um, midazolam is a benzodiazepine and it's a very, very strong one. And it is used um, in a number of situations, but benzos should not be used generally at all for anybody except in extreme emergencies. But midazolam is actually a, a powerful sedative. It's not a painkiller, it's a sedative. And so we see here that there was this huge spike in the use of midazolam right here, which begins, and I'll show you a, a blown out picture of this, right at the same time that those 11,000 people just up and died in April of 2020 in these care homes. Died of what? Well, the other thing that we have to point out here is that this is, um, these are statistics actually from what's called openprescribing.net, which shows you in the UK everything that was prescribed and used. And they track all of that stuff, of course, right? So midazolam, not only did it have this huge spike in April of 2020, and then a second spike out here in early, late 2020, early 2021, but then it rose throughout the rest of this period, whereas it had been pretty flat back here. So much more of this midazolam being used. Now, this is a second thing, which is actual and projected antibiotic prescriptions by month in the UK from 2017 through 2022. And you can see here, actual in blue, projected in red. And then this red dotted line is the difference between the two. So it, back in 2017, very little difference, which you can see with this red line hovering around zero between blue and the red, actual and projected. And there's a cadence to antibiotic use. And here you see again, very little difference from one to the next. And we're coming in, we're coming in through 2020 here, almost no difference whatsoever. And then all of a sudden, this line starts to deviate and spikes 
massively and then spikes again. There are two big spikes here where antibiotics were not being administered out of normal customary seasonal rhythm uses. Now it's used, when do you use antibiotics? Well, it's standard of care if for pneumonia, obviously, right? Even a viral pneumonia, you use it because viral pneumonias are often followed by an opportunistic bacterial pneumonia, right? So a viral, a pneumonia just means water in the lungs, so it's fluid in the lungs. So viral pneumonia will create that fluid in the lungs, which is a rich growth media for bacteria. And if you're in a hospital or a care home, there's a lot of bacteria floating around, unfortunately. Those are not very healthy places to be. And those get in the lungs. So it is routine care, or had been completely 100% routine care to give people who had or suspected had pneumonia a prophylactic or an active use of antibiotics to prevent that bacterial invasion, the secondary opportunistic infection with bacteria, which is a bad thing. So if you have viral pneumonia that's completely survivable, but you get an opportunistic bacterial invasion and pneumonia on top of that, lights out, no bueno, not very good. So now we have to ask a question, which is, why did the UK suddenly break decades of prescribing habits? Why did they suddenly massively not prescribe antibiotics at this moment. To turn to answers for that, we have to understand that how this all happened. So this is, David Webb is the chief pharmaceutical officer for England. He would have been the person most making and responsible for making the recommendations for what are we gonna use? What are we not gonna use? What's gonna be prescribed? Are there gonna be any changes to prescribing patterns? What are we gonna do about COVID? This man was um, actually right up at the top there of the people who would be making these sorts of decisions. And so let's look at this very quickly. Um, and uh, let me also give you one other setup here, which was, uh, this is just how bad things are in the UK. Oh, this was so awful. I reported on this in October of 2020. And uh, we this was the output of what's called the so-called recovery trial, where they were looking for HCQ effects. And so this is a clinical trial they ran. It was pretty big. And so I was very excited they were gonna run this and run this well, unfortunately. They ran it really poorly. In fact, it was designed to fail. This is how bad this is. This is really dark. I told you it was going to get dark. So what they found in this trial where they gave hydroxychloroquine to people, they said, well, there was no significant difference in the primary outcome of 28-day mortality between the two arms. 418 patients, that's 26.8% of people in the HCQ arm in 788 patients or 25.0% people in the standard of care arm had died, but whoa, these are horrifying numbers. Nobody else in the world is losing anywhere close to this number of people, these percentages. These are terrifying numbers, right? Do you take people, they come to the hospital and you lose a quarter of them? In Whether it's in standard care or this other one, this is bad. So we knew this was bad. And so their conclusion here was that participants in the HCQ arm were actually less likely to survive hospitalization, actually Nobody was likely to survive hospitalization. It was bad. And when we looked at this larger study, which was conducted by a Sir Martin Landsay, Landry and a Sir Peter Horby, these are the two guys right here who set this trial up. And by the way, we should note the study was not blinded. So they could sort of pick and choose who, who went into which arm, right? Other limitations here are they gave super toxic dosing. So these are people already in the hospital, already in the hospital. Some of them are, are either on vents they're already ventilated and they gave them hydroxychloroquine, not just a little bit, which would be a normal dose is 200 milligrams, maybe 400 milligrams in a day. They somehow found a way to give 2,400 milligrams on the first day, 800, 800, 800 across uh, six hour windows. And so that 2,400 milligrams is by itself, it's it's a pretty hefty dose for a normal healthy person, maybe not even that big of a deal. But for somebody who's on a ventilator, who's already wobbling at death's door to give that level of dosing, it's toxic. So for them to have found a slightly higher toxicity rate or, or bad outcome rate, not surprising. Nobody in the world that I've talked to can defend that level of dosing. But they just came up with it and they did it because these gentlemen are nasty buggers. No question about it. Of course, they gave it way too late in the cycle. There was no zinc, no azithromycin, no tetracycline, no antibiotics were given. These poor people were put on vents with huge amounts of lung damage and then given a toxic dose of something very, very late in the game. And surprise, it didn't work. And of course, this got splashed all over the world. Um, so that was bad. And 
So this is this is um, you know the write up about this. This was in I forget some some magazine came out um, about this. But again, they were proud to announce that there was has you know that nothing came of this, and so no clinical benefit. They say here. So again, but the key word here is in hospitalized patients. Okay, so. They say here, uh, 11,000 people, 175 NHS hospitals in the UK, da, 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 da. They say here, quote, we have concluded that there is no beneficial effect of HCQ in patients hospitalized with COVID-19. We therefore decided to stop enrolling participants in the HCQ arm of recovery trial with immediate effect. It's that bad. We're just stopping it. We are now releasing the preliminary results as they have important implications for patient care and public health. You mean public health of people who are already in the ICU. It's not, it's not exactly public health. It's a totally different concept. A total of 1,542 patients here, they say, um, you know, compared with 3,132 patients. Uh, again, with this horrifying 28-day mortality here on both, just horrifying. And look down here in red, they say these data convincingly rule out any meaningful mortality benefit of HCQ in patients hospitalized, already hospitalized. And of course, when they ran the molnupiravir trials and when they ran the Paxlovid trials, they specifically said, don't give this to, don't enroll somebody who's more than three days past symptom onset. Why? Because you don't give a antiviral to somebody who's already in the hospital. You want the antiviral to work on the virus when it's in the viral replication stage, which would be within the first few days of symptom onset. Everybody knows that. We've known that since the 50s. It's not a big deal. And interestingly, <clears throat> This was back in April 27th of 2020. Uh, even before, they, I'm sure they were just beginning thinking about forming this trial. I was like, because I saw these terrible HCQ stu studies coming out. So I was like, can I help? Here, I'm not even, I don't even design clinical trials, but let me give this a shot. Common sense, randomized trial, full stop. Has to be randomized um, and blinded. This was not a blinded study. Um, it was randomized, but not blinded. Treatment begun early, as soon as diagnosis, or upon appearance even of suggestive symptoms. Of course, duh. The doses are recorded, dosing frequency, because we saw trials where they forgot to like measure what they were giving. Zinc included, of course. Uh, track the blood levels, make sure you got it up to appropriate levels. And of course, azithromycin, um, plus minus. So if you really want to parse it out, but otherwise just include it. And that would be how you would conduct something like this. How did I know to do that? Because I'm not a dummy, that's how. And I wasn't trying to design something to fail and willing to risk people's lives to do that. All right, this is, now we get down to the heart of this whole thing. So here we see excess crude mortality rate, the CMR, in the United Kingdom here. And you can see there's this big spike that starts here. This is um, January, February. This is March right here. This is April, okay? And that's May. And then again, you see here starting about in October, November, December, that's January right there, uh, 2021. So October through um, January, February, March of 2021. And then, but this one is the biggie with this big spike right here in April. That's a huge spike right there. So what happened in April? Let's track it out. Now we're going to lay under that um, in exact alignment here of the prescribing and use of midazolam. And so this is the highest peak right here in this orange, which is something at 10 milligrams in a two mil solution. So they ordered all these ampules, um, which are little glass vials that are already pre-filled with known doses and um, uh, per a given volume. The highest dose per volume was 10 milligrams dissolved into two mils of solution. That was the one that we saw the most of, but every single category of midazolam, whether it was one mig per mil, um, one mig per five mils, whatever it was, all of those classifications are all peaked. And that peak right there is April of 2020. And again, there's another peak of use of midazolam right here in that second wave. All right. <clears throat> so, huh. Remember we said here that we saw that there was this huge spike in people with death, uh, dementia and Alzheimer's disease recorded on their death certificates. And here we're also noting that um, the highest dose here is for the 10 migs per 2 mils right here, which let me move this back over again, is that orange peak right there. And so this is a great, great piece in the Daily Beagle. It's a substack down here. I advise you to check that out, the Daily Beagle substack. They broke all this down, just did a beautiful job at it. 
and uh, they did two big pieces of work on this, and this is the second one. And they note here that the orders for 10 milligrams of midazolam spiked in April 2020. So, huh, that's kind of weird. Remember, the MHRA, which is an advisory body um, for the medicines out there, advises no more than 3.5 mg total for the over 60s, right? 3.5 mg, that's the top you would ever use. So what are you doing with an ampule with 10 mg in it? What's that all about? Um, and how did this come about? Well, it came about in no small measure because of this, which is we see here, and again, this is from an archived page. I had to pull a lot of this from archived areas. So this is coming to us back in May of 2020. They noted here in the pharmaceutical journal in the UK, they said here supplies of a sedative, this is a sedative, not a painkiller, used for COVID-19 patients diverted from France to avoid potential shortages um, some French label stock of midazolam is now being sold into UK wholesalers. There was no urgent panic scramble for midazolam in the United States, but they certainly scrambled for it in the UK. Um, and so uh, as well, we saw it here in Australia. We saw end of life and palliative care medication prescribing going on in the um down in Australia, and what did they do here? They followed along with exactly what was found there and what was advised in the UK, and it was this, distressing shortness of breath at rest. What would you do? Well, you might give morphine 10 milligram plus midazolam 10 migs. Oh, what? That is a huge amount. And by the way, we're gonna combine that with low flow conventional oxygen therapy Low flow, like if you have somebody with distressing shortness of breath at rest, the last thing you want to do is give them morphine and midazolam, which will suppress respiration while giving them low flow oxygen. Like, I, I don't even, like what in the, this, this is called hastening someone to the great beyond. This is not about care. This is not about what, uh, and by the way, midazolam, it's not a painkiller. So if somebody's at distress, all you can do is give them a sedative. They're going to be knocked back, but they're still going to be completely able to experience everything. They just won't struggle as much and you won't notice it um, because they will be knocked, at, knocked down, knocked back. But this is crazy, crazy stuff that we're seeing here. So I was really, really intrigued by um, this thing that I had to find out about, which is where did all this flow from? And this flows from actually from the UK. They put out a special directive. So I was going to go and look for this which is NICE, which is a regulatory body in the UK. Um, and they had this guidance called NG163, but of course that's pulled off of their website. So I went for the Wayback Machine. I go to Google and so I give it, I give it that whole search term. NICE, NG163 quotes Wayback, because I want this to come from the Wayback Machine. And it only returned 271 results. Usually there's billions. So uh, there's not, we didn't find anything. Not many great matches for your search. And Nothing. The first most likely thing here is they said, uh, can we give you something, a full text of practical blacksmithing? Has none of my quoted words in it. Nothing. Nothing. It came up with nothing, right? Which, of course, tells me that this all begins to make more sense now that this is the new motto for this company. Not, it doesn't include the word don't anymore. Um, so I checked this whole same thing out, same search term, exactly, put it in Brave. Ta-da! There it is. Found it right away and was able to quickly find this, which is this NIC guideline, which was published on the 3rd of April. So by the time it's published on the 3rd of April, that means it's already been through some months of, of prior review. And this was COVID-19 rapid guideline, just a guideline, managing symptoms, including at the end of life in the community. So they're already worried about how they're gonna manage end of life. And so we dig down deeper into this um, NG163 document, Table five, treatments for the last days and hours of life for managing breathlessness for patients aged 18 and older. And look at this dosage right here. They said midazolam, 10 mg over 24 hours via the syringe driver. It's a funny way to put it, but syringe driver. It's giving somebody a shot of this thing. Increase stepwise to midazolam 60 milligrams over a 24 hour period as required, 60 milligrams. Remember that, that's like, that would kill a horse. It's unbelievable. And as well, they're talking about, hey, morphine sulfate, give a bunch of that, you know, um, and uh, special considerations. Notice what they say down here in yellow, special considerations for the caregiver in a care home, for instance. Sedation, 
with benzodiazepines, such as midazolam described above, sedation and opioid use should not be withheld because of an inappropriate fear of causing respiratory depression. In somebody who's already struggling to breathe, what they're saying here, sedation and opioid use should not be withheld because you're worried that you're going to kill the person. You're going to hasten their end. It bears repeating that COVID-19 caused a lot of people to be the happy hypoxics to show that they were having difficulty maintaining oxygen sat levels, and many of them survived, right? People, even with the worst of care, going on to a vent and getting remdesivir, some of them still survived that whole treatment. So this was not necessarily something that required an end of life. We've got to give lethal injections of things, right? But again, where, 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 where would this be? Where, where did anybody debate this? Where, where was the consent? Where were the people being, where, I would love to see the documents and say, hey, listen, uh, your mom there seems to be struggling for breath. Do you mind if we just, you know, give her a little something and cut to the chase? There was no informed consent. There was no, I'm guaranteed there was nothing where, where anybody was given proper notification about this. And this, that's just horrifying, right? Um, and so they say here, note, notes, here's a note, here's a note for you at the time of publication of April 2020, opioids and benzos did not have a UK marketing authorization for this indication or route of administration. Now, who put that together? Again, remember the banality of evil. Um, Somebody had to put that together, and it was this guy right here, and um, he managed to, you know, put this uh, NG-163 out. So that's interesting. So let's carry on a little further. And this, again, came through that uh, the Beagle substack thing there. They pointed out this. They pointed to this article, which says, hey, in the British Medical Journal right here, we're going to look at this article that came out in March of 2022, where they talk about the efficacy and safety of drugs used for assisted dying. And they would note here that the dose range, if you want to... drugs injected for euthanasia, you would consider a dose range for midazolam of somewhere between 2 and 120 mg. They note here that 2 milligrams is potentially sufficient to create euthanasia. Now, what did they say in their guidelines? They said, ah, you know what? Yeah, up to 60 milligrams of midazolam over a 24-hour period. Ah, great. Morphine, you know, again, they give you a range here. Fentanyl, they were using all of these, and they were using a lot of these uh, curare uh, derivatives here, pancuronium and rocuronium and all those other things. So they were using all of those things. So, so, so let's get the timing right. Somewhere early on, they had to have ordered enough syringes and midazolam, and that took time. And we saw that they had done that sometime before um, March of 2020. Sometime, well, that article came out in May. But they had to have had this stuff in place, right? Because we see here, somehow they got it from France in time to be able to order it through their system so that they were giving the most of it in April. And as they were giving most of it in April, we saw that in that same month, there was a huge number of patients, 17,316 died in England in April alone with dementia and Alzheimer's disease recorded on their death certificates, which means they were probably in care homes. And this was three times more than expected. So that's 11,000 people who died because they were probably administered what we now know to be a lethal dose of midazolam coupled with morphine. So all of this is happening. Um, and uh, I, I might note that um, this now picture actually terrorizes me. So um, this now looks like one of the more frightening pictures you could have out there. Because at least people coming at you with machine guns through a jungle... You know, you got a shot at escaping. This, I don't even know how to, how to th- this is now terrorizing to me. And, of course, we saw that the same thing was happening down in Australia at the same time, which means that, um, you know, these people, I think they were still safer and um, <laughs> they, had, they had more of a chance at surviving this out encounter than, uh, than they would have their NSW um, health policies. You remember, Brian, play this one. I remember this. These are people who are outside protesting the lockdown. And, and they're actually at, at, those are shots you hear are, are rubber bullets being fired into a crowd of screaming, retreating people. There's old people, there's children. They're holding their hands up. 
They're clearly not a threat, but you know when you're all kitted up and you got your rubber bullets, what the heck? Aim and fire. So that's what's going. Oh yeah, there you go. There you go. There you go. Little Kent State action, Australia style, right? Horrifying, horrifying, horrifying stuff going on. So even as um, the Australian health authorities were busy thinking of ways to maybe hasten end of life for folks, um, their authorities were out busy uh, knocking people out of parks where they were quite rightly saying this all doesn't smell right or seem right to us. Um, this comes to us, so this is a health and social care committee meeting held on Friday, 17th of April, 2020. This is still up on, on websites out there. I didn't save this special. But this is a gentleman, Dr. Evans, and it's very bizarre. He's going to talk now with Matt Hancock, but he's speaking to a lot of other people who are on this call, which include a lot of the health authorities. This is April 17th. This is before really they've had like a big wave. Like they don't really know what COVID's going to be. But April again is when they had most of the people dying of dementia and Alzheimer's in their care homes. And we saw that they weren't using antibiotics during this period of time, and they were giving a lot of midazolam out. So nobody else in the world early in 2020, everybody's wondering, how do we treat COVID? What can we do? Are we going to need ventilators? How can we do this? Pierre Corey's already worked out and resolved corticosteroids. All of this stuff's happening. Listen to what Dr. Evans here, who is um, a health on, on one of the governing health bodies, who would have been responsible for coming up with some of these new standards of care that we just looked at. Let's listen in on how he's talking about what's most urgently needed as we're facing this unknown pandemic with unknown treatments and survivability. Carry on. The hard work you and uh, your team are, are, are doing. Um, I noticed in your battle plan, um, one of the things that uh, I think potentially was missing um, was when we talk about battle and in, in medicine, death is an inevitability and something you have to deal with. I just wondered, you've put in a Herculean effort uh, to get the ITU spaces and the ventilators. However, a lot of people who um, will suffer from coronavirus and indeed other conditions will never make it onto the intensive care unit. So I wondered what uh, sort of provisions you have for the number of people who may be dying at home. And I've got a few questions about that. Do you know the number of people who are dying at home currently or have an estimate? Oh. Uh, well, we do know the number of people who die outside of hospital um, and they That's very largely at the, um, die at home. It comes back to the very first exchange no. uh, between with the chair. Uh, on the number of deaths reported. They're reported through ONS because we have to collect the data from the death certificates. So with, with that, I mean, a, a good death needs three things. It needs equipment, it needs medication, and it needs um, the staff to administer it. So in terms of equipment, uh, a few quick questions. Do you have enough syringe drivers in the NHS to deliver medications to keep people comfortable when they're passing away? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, there was a challenge raised about this um, about eight days ago, and we re resolved that actually it wasn't so as big a challenge as, as was made public, and we've, so plenty we've of resolved syringes. that. So yes, um, right now we do. Okay. And the second one is with that, that's to, the syringe drivers deliver medication, particularly things like midazolam and morphine. Um, do you have any precautions put in place to make sure we have enough of those medications to be delivered? Yes. We've got a big project to make sure that um, th those sorts of medications, as well as uh, the ITU medications that I spoke about earlier, that the supply chains, the global supply chains for those medicines are, are clear. Um, they are, in fact, th those medicines are made in a relatively small number of factories around the world. So it is a delicate supply chain and we are uh, in uh, contact with the whole supply chain. And in line with that, morphine is currently prescribed per patient. The reason to do that is to stop it being abused. So I have to prescribe it for Mr. Hancock. However, in this situation, if you're going into a healthcare home, um, you may not want to waste precious things like morphine. Have you considered relaxing the laws around morphine prescribing for doctors and healthcare professionals so that there isn't waste? That's something that we keep under review. I've looked at that particular point to reduce wastage of key medicines and it's something that the supply chain uh, the supply team sorry in um uh in the department and uh the clinical team uh talk about all the time i don't know if that's jvt's part of the clinical team and he may want to say more 
Wow. And number three is, uh, uh, do you have the people who are going to be willing to carry out these particular instruction sets? So this is really disturbing because what you see here is people um, in a position of authority already plotting out, well, do we have enough midazolam and morphine, which is an odd combination, right? Remember, they said, hey, we've never approved this particular combo of things before. Hey, this guidance came out in April of 2020, right? And this guy who's on the team that would have been I presume, writing that particular piece of guidance, they'd already thought it through and they said, you know, there's going to be a lot of people dying out there, but we should make sure they have a good death. And the way we can assure that is make sure that we have sufficient equipment. We need um, syringe drivers, right? We need to make sure we have plenty of this midazolam and morphine, which they had already pre-ordered way excessively from France, which was one of their supply chains, to make sure they had enough midazolam on hand to do what they thought they needed to do. And then COVID comes along, and next thing you know, lots of people are dying, principally in care homes, all right? So remember, this is this right here shows you that March 20th, this is one of their first death waves right here. And this peaks out here in the middle of April. And so this is right here is when they're talking about all of this stuff. This That exact peak right there that that first yellow dot is on right here is when the a vast peak of midazolam usage was recorded in England. And then they have this second peak of what they call attributed to COVID, but who knows what this really people were actually dying of. And it's this peak right here where they're not giving lots and lots of antibiotics. So those two peaks right there, this first one's shorter and sharper. The second one is longer and broader. I've actually indicated those exactly on this particular um, chart right here. And we can see that um, this first wave right here, uh, there's, eh, it's not that big of a gap. It's there, but it's not the hugest. But the second wave, when they saw the most deaths, they had this very, very large gap in prescribing between what they should have expected to prescribe. In fact, I would have expected more, not less, more during a COVID outbreak, which is a respiratory virus outbreak. But you can see COVID wave one, Looks to me like it was driven by midazolam deaths or murders, if we want to call it that, which I do. And the second one was really driven, at least in large measure, by failing to prescribe life-saving antibiotics in the maw of a large pandemic. And it turns out that actually killed more people. Um, so that's how I see those things coming out. Now, here's the interesting thing. You want to know what I think the tell is in this? I, I gave this data out to my uh, subscribers a while back. But when you actually dig into the excess mortality data, in the UK, and the UK is England plus Scotland plus Wales and Ireland, right? When you look at this, these are Z-scores, so anything that, these are standard deviations above normal. By the time you see here, here in England, this is the top one right here, we see Z-scores of over 20. This is like, it like never happens. These are massive, massive, massive additional deaths that are being driven, and this is in the 45 to 65 year old range right here, 45 to 64. And we see here this huge, nasty spike of deaths right here back in April of 2020 in England, but we don't see it in Ireland. And we see a little bump, but not nearly as dramatic. In fact, almost uh, not even relevant in Scotland and nothing in Wales. Now, wait a minute, this is a pandemic where we're told massive numbers of people died, huge, spiky, spiky spikes, and it didn't happen in Ireland or Scotland or Wales, which I would consider it's small or small regions. This is like a reasonable test bed to say, wow, something really bad happened in England and England alone. And we see the same sorts of things. You will see more of bumps down here when you get into the 65 and older crowd, but something happened here in England to the 45 to 65 year old age group, which did not happen, right? And also happened in 2021 here, which did not happen again in 2021, that second spike in Ireland or Scotland or Wales. This is screaming evidence that something really brutal and nasty happened in England. And uh, I think with uh, this particular gentleman's demeanor, uh, this is cold, really cold what he's talking about here. Uh, listen, do we have enough syringe drivers and drugs and willing um, labor to get the job done? Because, you know, maybe people need their, their lives hastened along here. And um, we've just written a new standard which is going to allow us to put basically what we know to be euthanasia levels of these compounds into people. That's the story, and that's how it all breaks out. So 
When I look at this, I call this the Medazolam murders. A lot of other people do as well. I think this is the actual story that the UK cannot possibly bury fast enough. So guess what? We're going to throw Matt Hancock under the bus for some inappropriate WhatsApp tweets. Maybe that's the story, or maybe there are two stories here. That was bad, and this is bad. But this is awful. So... What we know is, first, that even before COVID deaths became a thing in the UK, the UK had already made plans to bring in large amounts of midazolam from foreign suppliers, and they did that. And then they discussed, hey, do we have enough needles and staff to end all these lives that might need to be ended comfortably? Nobody else in the entire world was even talking about that. Nobody. Nobody at all. Nobody else was, was sitting down publicly saying, you know, Maybe we should think about a way that we can off these people who are kind of close to the end so they have a comfortable way out. I, nobody else was talking about that, and that wasn't part of the COVID discussion set at all, except in the UK, except in England. And then mysteriously, a huge 300% increase in Alzheimer's deaths were recorded straight after in, in April at the time of the largest amount of midazolam administration. And then right after that, we saw a higher death rate than ever, than ex- would be expected, but also a much, much lower use of antibiotics, life-saving pneumo- pneumonia-indicated um, antibiotics. And then COVID deaths in UK hospitals, vastly higher than anywhere else, right? right? Um, and then bizarrely, only England out of the entire UK set had vastly elevated excess deaths in early COVID in the 45 to 65 group. Um, So bizarre. And then, as I showed you, the HCQ trials, those were rigged to fail, designed, especially that recovery trial, horrid, horrid, horrid that they did that. And those patients were subjected to a totally inappropriate protocol. It should never have been approved by an institutional review board. It should never have been conducted. It made no sense whatsoever, unless your point was to prove that it doesn't work and just put a big thing out there to say it doesn't work. So this is the nature of the story that we're actually up against. So that's the story as it stands right now. It's dark, and I'm really sorry for how dark it is, but it's the nature of the game. It's reality. And if we stare at that straight up, we understand who we're actually up against and what they're capable of, which is pretty much almost anything. So if you come by peak prosperity, listen, we're not going to spend any more time talking about how bad this is. we got to talk about solution space. We've got to figure out what we're going to do. Step one, know about this stuff. Step two, hey, um, we have to figure out how we're going to hang around the people who we want to hang out with who aren't like that, right? So there's a lot of people out there who are like that, but many more who aren't. So find your tribe. And we're doing that because we know that with these same people in charge, There's no easy way out of what's coming next. Um, They're that bad. They're either that grubby and self-interested and psychopathic, whatever it is. They are incapable of making common sense decisions that are in the common good. So because of that, there's no chance that they're going to figure out what to do when the economy begins to really erode or when the central banks overprint money again or when the fertilizer shortage hits or when the food shortages hit because of that and other reasons, whatever. They're going to do a terrible job, which means you need to be resilient. And the best way to get resilient is find other people who are on that path who can help you. Hey, we are assembling the number one online resilience community of peak prosperity. That's what we do. I'm the information scout. We find the stories. And then as a community, we figure out what are we going to do about that together. So if that interests you, come on by. If not, hey, it's been great talking with you here. Be well. Be safe. Remember, it doesn't have to be this way. See you next time. Bye-bye. The beauty of saying it's an emergency is very difficult to challenge any of this stuff. Our wealth is being stolen via our money. I would have never come here if I thought it was lost. I know we did.